Sure, sure. Okay. Hello. How are you? Did everyone have fun updating their Zoom today? <laughs> you look, put a little delay for everyone, didn't it? All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. See if I can get this presentation up. We have a really great presentation for you in store tonight. Let me just tell you, um, our grantees, our external grantees uh, have agreed to give you a little tour, a little virtual tour of their um, sites. And I originally, when we thought we'd do this meeting, I thought, you know, maybe a few of these guys are going to want to get up and, and do this kind of thing. And um, I was astonished. Basically, every one of them wanted to do this and have sent me gorgeous pictures and descriptions of their projects. So um, without further ado, because we do have everyone who's going to be speaking tonight, we're going to get started with Karen Palmer. And Karen is going to tell us about the small fruit team at Heritage Farm. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, and this is not just me. This is a large group of people who put the small fruit team together. So I'm going to start with blueberries. If you want to go to the first slide there, because um, this is how we all started. Can you hear me, Janice? Yeah, go, go to the next slide, please. Yes, the blueberries. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, it all started, the small fruit team kind of started, I don't re even remember, it's like five or maybe six years ago with the blueberries. And this was a established blueberry field at the farm. And um, we kind of took it over. A group of master gardeners started to maintain it. It had been totally kind of uh, ignored for quite a while. And so we do a lot of classes there. We started out with blueberry pruning classes and you can see uh, John Moore there. He's kind of the head of the blueberry field, uh, teaching some of the, teaching somebody, I think this, they're fertilizing here. So we've taken up fertilizing. We have people who adopt rows and they uh, weed it and mulch it. And this was a real mess, I can tell you, when we first started taking it over, it was overrun by, weeds and crabgrass and, and blackberry brambles. And you can see now it, it actually looks pretty good. So this was the actual beginning of the small fruit team. And so the next slide shows the next fruit we added in were strawberries. And strawberries are headed up by Becca Martin. Uh, we have three raised beds uh, with neutral, straw, day neutral, um, ever bearing and uh, June bearing strawberries. And we've done several uh, strawberry workshops. Becca and I have put together uh, a strawberry workshop. We're actually doing it again this spring. So stay tuned if you're interested to uh, open to the public. And we've also done a lot of master gardener training with the strawberries. The next fruit we added, because now we're on a roll, we have blueberries, we have strawberries. So the next slide Next slide, <laughs> Janice, <laughs> would be grapes. <laughs> and that is headed up by Stuart Campbell, who's up there in the, the top left. The uh, Master Gardener Foundation provided a grant for us to build the trellis system that you can kind of see there in the background behind Stuart. We have five rows already planted and we're adding uh, two more rows this spring. But you can see we used master gardeners to build the trellis, put in the irrigation system. It was quite a learning experience for all of us. We propagated all of our own grapes. You can see the pots of grapes there that we propagated just from all of our own yards. And the picture there on the lower right shows um, some of the vines that have really grown quite well. They've only been in about a year and a half. So they've really taken off. We're adding, as I said, we're adding two more rows this year. So the next slide will show you that we then ventured out into kiwis and kiwis are headed up by Pam Russell. So this past year is when we put this in. And so the Master Gardener Foundation grant uh, funded the trellis, uh, trellis unit that you can see there. 
John and Stuart built the trellis and we got it installed and we've run the wires and we have two kiwi plants uh, planted and Pam is putting another one in this, this spring, both hardy and uh, fuzzy kiwis. So they're, they're right there by the strawberries. If you're driving up the hill and you see that funny looking trellis unit, it's uh, the kiwis. So they're pretty young. Uh, we haven't done any outreach yet with this, but we do plan to uh, have some classes on pruning kiwis. And I can tell you from experience that that's a big job. So the next slide, that's kind of what we have so far. And what's coming down the pike are uh, raspberries. This is a project that Justin has started doing some kind of research with raspberries, but master gardeners have been helping all along. And uh, you can see they're planting the raspberries. We uh, have helped weed it. And the goal is that um, when he's done with his project, the small fruit team will take over the raspberry field. So that will be another avenue for us to um, have some classes. And also this next year, you can just go to my final uh, slide there, we, uh, which just shows a pretty blueberry uh, with a bee on it. Um, but we're gonna put in some figs. So that's our next endeavor also. We're gonna be putting in a few fig plants that we're gonna be propagating ourselves. And we have invited all the little critters to come in and enjoy our fruits, the fruits of our labors. And it's just been a lot of fun. So we appreciate the support and uh, look for us putting on some workshops pretty soon. Thanks. Thanks so much, Karen. Great job. Boy, that is an interesting project. Uh, let me go ahead to the next speaker is Mike Peterson and he heads up the Veterans Garden over at Mabry Center. And Mike, so far we can't hear you. Are you trying to speak? There we go. Now I think you can hear me. I uh, thank you for uh, being able to come here and share what we've been doing. Um, this uh, garden project started uh, a few, well, seven years ago, um, and it's evolved quite a bit with the help of the Master Gardeners um, Foundation. This uh, last year, the things we really kind of used to get was like, seedling mix, seed trays, things like that. But um, you really have been contributing all along to our to our program. Um, and we still got a long ways to go. This first slide here, this is our greenhouse where we get stuff uh, started. And, and we've kind of got our misters in and we've got tables in. We need to get more than that one of these days, but it's a start. Um, next slide. And uh, so this is just a, uh, some of our beans there, but the pallets there on the right, that was kind of one of our fun projects. So one of the things I try to do every year is I try to do something different. And really the goal of this garden is, is we're, we're working with people that are doing community service, alternative community service. And so it's really kind of a teaching opportunity for people to put their hands in the dirt. Some already know something about gardening, some know nothing about gardening. So it's a great, it's a great chance to, to, to learn and, and I think it does so much uh, more than just like the plants. But so these pallets on the right, this was something we tried this year, growing potatoes in them. And that was kind of a fun project. We did a few different uh, ways of growing potatoes. Um, but next uh, slide. Uh, and this was the other, we did burlap bags. I had a ton of coffee bean bags. And so we thought we'd try two ways this year rather than digging trenches or other ways that we've done in the past. Um, it was actually kind of fun. Um, both worked pretty well. I probably will do both again this year just for fun again. Um, and uh, next slide. So this is our in-ground garden. And this uh, that irrigation line is right there on the picture on the right. That's something that um, we've gotten through the help of the Master Gardener Foundation, we've done a drip system. Um, part of kind of what I try to do is to show people different ways that we can plant things in the ground or in raised beds. Um, so this is kind of one way we're doing it. Um, here you can see uh, 
we've got the black plastic mulch down on our rows and um we did start doing that last year with monies we got this year we we stepped up and we we had a lot of free wood chips and so we started laying them down in between the aisles as kind of like a, a weed barrier and it was a fantastic thing because it just allowed us to put more time into the plants and not as much time into weeding um and it just looked good um next slide please Yeah, okay, so this is kind of more part of the original part of it. So let's say we got creative in um, making raised beds. One of them was using tires, and then the other one, you'll see some tables there in that greenhouse frame. Those were something that we built uh, using ADS pipe, and we made them basically like wheelchair accessible, assuming that maybe we'd have somebody that would have needs, needs there like that. Um, it was kind of part of the original idea for the garden, but um, it's been kind of a neat way to also show again, like different ways you can utilize space or make something, you know, to, to grow, grow in. Um, next slide. And this again, just kind of like looking into our in-ground garden this year, it was back in the spring uh, when we got stuff started. Uh, and then as it kind of grown through the summer months, uh, I try to always do, my goal is to always kind of like do 80% of what we're good at and then always try something different or do something in a different way and, uh, and it just kind of gets people involved that way. Um, everything that we've raised, we donate to the uh, food bank at the Salvation Army, which has been a great uh, kind of a experience too because it just kind of helps people it's a give back for people and it just sees like the rewards for their effort. Um, I think that the uh, garden has done a great job kind of teaching delayed gratification and that includes me too. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, this is more of our garden through the summer. The other thing we've incorporated over the last few years is trying to get pollinators and flowers in there just to kind of soften the look of it. This is about what it looks like in probably July or August, I'm thinking from the looks of it. And then here's another uh, shot kind of of those tables. Uh, we've grown different things right there. You'll see we did onions in them and that those tables just grow onions great. So it's always just kind of fun to see what we can do in them. We've grown cucumbers and tomatoes and peppers and lettuce and kale. So we, we've tried a lot of things. Um, these are our onions. And uh, this was kind of the palette. There was kind of a fun way we made for drying them this year after we harvested them. And that was kind of a neat experience. That was something that we've never uh, used before. Uh, definitely something we'll try again. And just a little more, just kind of uh, stuff we produce. This is, uh, we're ridiculous on peppers. <laughs> but uh, next. <laughs> yeah, and this is just more of like kind of example of just what we're able to take out on a daily uh I shouldn't say daily. We try to pick twice a, twice a week in the summer on a Monday and Thursday. And this is like just a typical day uh, when we're full, going full. And it, it's quite an effort to pick, but it's a it's been a really neat experience to do this with people. Uh, next. That's it, Mike. Oh, that's it. All right. Yeah. You have anything uh, else to say to share? Yeah. You know, it's just been such a neat experience. You know, this thing has just kind of evolved and the Master Gardener Foundation has done so much to help us out. I, I mean, I just can't thank you enough. It's really, we're really teaching people on gardening and we're kind of learning ourselves as we're going along too, because I think gardening, you know, you learn that uh, what I try to teach people is that feeling's okay at it. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, something you go like, we've had things where like massive failure and it's like, you just go and you do something again next year. So it's been a really good uh, teaching tool and, you know, we're always trying to be creative. So any suggestions, I'll always take them for something different and new. That's Mike, great. Can you, you tell us the location of this um, organization? Yeah, this is. Yeah, this, so I'm with Clark County. It's a district court, but it's the community restitution is kind of the department, but we're located at the Mabry Work Center, which is in um, 8101 on Northeast 117th. It's kind of right at the intersection of Patton Parkway and 117th. And, um, you know, I, I love showing people the garden. So if anybody wants to come out and check it out, 
I'd be happy to give tours. It ain't very pretty right now, but in the summer, it looks real pretty. Exactly. Yeah, all of them right now. Thank yeah. you so much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Okay. And then you can go ahead. Oh, sorry. I can go ahead. Um, all right. Well, the next item is the organic field, which is at Heritage Farm, and I will be presenting that. So... <laughs> Uh, the organic practices demonstration field is located at Heritage Farm. The three acre organic field demonstrates the production of vegetables, herbs, small fruits, and cover crops using organic practices. It is used as an educational site with hands-on learning of all phases of production. And it includes topics such as garden maintenance, crop rotation, timing of planting and harvesting, integrated pest management, garden sanitation, vertical growing, seed saving, succession planting, plant division, and identifying plant pests and diseases. Um, this year we had a little trouble with cucumber beetles and we addressed the issue by seeking extension resources which recommended using cultural and mechanical methods to, to manage the uh, impact. And so our pest, Pesticide-free zone encouraged the presence of the beneficial soldier beetle, which has been known to consume the eggs and larvae of bat cucumber beetle. So we were really excited when we saw these guys in the garden. And uh, in addition to providing horticulture education, the fresh produce is harvested and delivered to local food pantries two to three days per week throughout the growing season. In 2021, 13 volunteers participated two to three days per week from mid-May through mid-October. And approximately 3,600 pounds of fruit, vegetables, herbs, and dried beans were produced. Additionally, we grow leeks, garlic, and shallots. Those are planted in one row and are harvested the following spring and summer. Some of the organic practices include maintaining an undisturbed perennial row and planting cover crops. Our perennial row contains artichoke, strawberry bushes, herbs, and flowers to host beneficial insects, spiders, Pacific tree frogs, and garter snakes. We need those for the voles. <laughs> A previously unused area of the field is planted with cover crops and will be tilled under the following spring to help enrich and build soil structure. The organic field is also the site that is used to trial new vegetable varieties for the Master Gardener Foundation Mother's Day weekend plant sale. Prior to the pandemic, the organic field was used for in-person community horticulture education activities, such as hands-on tomato pruning workshops. In 2021, three outdoor in-person sessions for the WSU Extension Master Gardener trainees were held here. The Master Gardener Foundation grant provided the funds for compost, fertilizer, plant starts, seeds, irrigation tubing, row cover, and seeding and potting mixes. And that's it. Next up, is Chris Potter, and she's going to tell us about River Home Link. Chris, are you there? Yes, here I am. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's been interesting so far to see the, the projects that the Master Gardener Foundation has funded. Um, our school garden at River Home Link is made up of um, a, a natural area that has a natural native hedgerow, um, a vegetated bioswale and other native plants and also 16 raised beds for vegetables. Um, we have two vegetable gardening elective classes at River Home Link. River Home Link is a K-12 public parent partnered alternative school that serves homeschool families. Um, so we have these two gardening electives. One is for students in kindergarten through fourth grade and the other is students um, fourth grade through eighth grade. Last year, um, the pandemic 
kept us away from the garden, actually for almost a year and a half, we were out of the garden. Um, and it made it a challenge for one of our favorite units, which the Master Gardeners really helps to fund for us. And that's a unit called Plant Parts You, plant parts you Eat. And during this unit, we study each of the six plant parts, roots, stems, leaves, flowers, fruits, and seeds. And we study the scientific um, functions of each of these plant parts. And then the students are allowed to um, taste everything raw and prepared in some way. We also go through, uh, as we go through the plant parts, we talk about, we brainstorm edible, edible, uh, edible examples of that plant part. So what are roots that we eat? What are stems that we eat and so forth? Um, and then we focus particularly on the ones that grow well here. Um, what you're seeing in the picture on the right is a packet of vegetables and materials that we sent home to students last year. And we did our cooking, one of our cooking lessons over Zoom, um, which was pretty interesting with um, first and second grade boys that I had in one class and then uh, some older kids, but it went really well. Um, the, the samples that you see there are the roots, stems and leaves. And we, um, they tasted them all as they were cooking them. But to have the experience of touching the, um, the plant parts, smelling them, tasting them, feeling them, cutting them up, it really expands the student's vegetable repertoire. And so when it comes time to plan the garden, which is our next unit, um, when I ask them, what do you want to grow? I don't just get green beans, strawberries, and corn because they've tasted rutabagas and parsnips and beets and bok choy and Brussels sprouts, I have little tiny kids coming to me saying, Mrs. Potter, can I grow rutabagas in my garden? Mrs. Potter, can I grow kohlrabi in my garden? And so it's really very exciting. Um, it really gets the kids interested. It helps them to know uh, where their food comes from, but mostly it introduces them to new things. Because we're a parent partnered program, we often have parents in our class as well as our students. And um, so these lessons are not only things that are restricted to the classroom, but they go home with the parents, with the families. And the families are able to try these recipes at home and they learn gardening techniques that they can take home with them. Um, having the parents there on campus also helps them to understand that vegetable gardening doesn't have to be a huge undertaking. We have um, four by eight and four by four foot beds, and they're amazed to see how much can be planted using the square foot garden method in those small beds. And it gives them the confidence to be able to go home and try new things in their own gardens at home. So the, the Master Gardener funding provides the, the money for a lot of this food, the food that I have to buy. Unfortunately, we do, <laughs> we have to do the plant parts you eat unit in the winter because we have to stay inside. And so that's when we do it. So I do have to purchase all the food that they're tasting. The picture on the left shows things that they were tasting um, this fall. Uh, that were still in the garden. So we did have some tastings out in the garden as well. Um, the other part of our project is uh, when we put in the outdoor learning space in 2015, we asked for another grassy area to um, convert to another wildlife um, type area. And the district said, as long as we maintained the first part to their standards, we could have the second part. So um, we, did, we did do that, we met that contingency, but unfortunately the pandemic has struck and we have not been able to proceed with that project. We've requested Master Gardener funds for the last two years and haven't been able to use that part of the funding because we haven't been able to get started yet. But this year, um, I think we will be able to. We're planning to install um, a living willow structure, a dome, a willow dome, large enough to hold a class. We're going to install perennial beds. So we'll have asparagus and artichokes and rhubarb and maybe some other things. And then we'll put in some um, cane berries 
and some fruit trees and some more um, native plants for habitat. Um, our, our staff, as well as our students and families, enjoy the outdoor learning space too. I find staff going out there and having their lunch. Um, I find many classes besides just the gardening classes going out there, the art classes go out for inspiration. Um, a high school reading class goes out there just to sit and do their reading because it's a very nice relaxing place to be. So um, I appreciate all the help that we've gotten from the Master Gardener Foundation in the past and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you so much, Chris. We've got some great comments in the in the uh, comment box, the chat box. Um, people are really liking that program that you um, described. Okay, next up, we have Nature Scaping of Southwest Washington, their Wildlife Botanical Gardens. And this is gonna be presented by Meredith Hardin. Meredith, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you, go right ahead. Okay, I can't start my video, it says because the host won't allow me. So, okay, okay. Let me help you. Thank you. So I am Meredith Hardin. I'm president of Nature Scaping and we manage the Wildlife Botanical Gardens. And can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, we were funded by the Master Gardener Foundation for two educational signs in the Wildlife Botanical Gardens. And we, um, I'm sorry, I'm hearing an echo, so it's kind of throwing me off. But um, so traditionally we have had paper forms of these posters that were, were funded, two of them, and they were in wood signs. And over the years, they would be damaged. Turn my speaker off. I Meredith, you seem to have you seem to have called in on two separate devices. So you've got two devices going. Um, I just came in through the link. Uh, Do you have your phone on and your computer? Now, now you're muted. Let me unmute you. No. Mm, okay, how's that now? Can you hear me all right now? There's still a little bit of an echo, but if you want to continue, I think you're okay. Okay. So anyway, the um, one of the signs, Backyard Bird Shop, has a poster that they created, and it is of the birds of the Pacific Northwest. It's four pages. So a few years ago, the Master Gardener Foundation funded pages one and two to make into an alumetal sign. So it withstands the weather now. Um, it's it's a, a product through Soha Signs in downtown Vancouver. And so this year or in 2020, um, the foundation funded pages three and four to make a second alumetal sign. And this was also um, donated from the Packard Bird Shop in digital format to Soha, Soha Signs. The second sign that was funded is this Native Bees. And this is through the Pollinator Partnership National Organization. They also gave us permission to um, create this alumetal sign. And it is now hanging under our Mason Bee display out in the gardens. So come on out to the gardens anytime. We're open every day. 
and you can go and find these two signs. And Julie Carlson, Master Gardener, is a coordinator of the Bird Haven Garden. So you'll find both of those signs on the birds of the Pacific Northwest in the Bird Haven Garden. Um, we appreciate all the interaction with master gardeners, all the master gardeners who work out in our gardens. We thank you very much and to the foundation for all your support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meredith. Sorry about that um, uh, microphone there. So um, I think a speaker was on or something, but all right, we will move on to the next project. And this is the Maplewood Mosley Community Garden. And this is gonna be presented by Patricia Wozniak. Patricia, are you there? I am here. Very good, we can okay. hear you. Go right good. ahead. Good. So I am Pat Wozniak, as uh, Janice told you, and I am representing the Maplewood Mosley Community Garden at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Vancouver. Uh, back in early 2020, just as the pandemic was beginning, UUCV was interested in funding a, finding a project that would benefit our Maplewood neighbors. Um, Maplewood is the neighborhood around our church. While focusing attention on our values of social and environmental justice, we met with the Maplewood Neighborhood Association and other stakeholders and they told us that they would really like us to, to build a community garden for their residents. Um, can you go to the next? No, this is a good slide. Go to the next slide, please. The first slide was the groundbreaking. Uh, it, so starting in late 2020, volunteers from UUCV and the wider community built 24 raised beds, as you can see here, uh, a kiosk and a picnic area. You want to go to the next? Yeah, thank you. Um, so here you can see the kiosk on the right, and you can see the picnic benches, and you can also see a shed in the rear. We installed an irrigation system in the garden, a fence surrounding the garden, and a shed. Right here. Um, next slide, please. So you can see the shed in the rear here, as well as the um, trellises on the beds and the fence around the garden. We're grateful to the Master Gardener Foundation for providing the funds for building the shed and for building the picnic area. We also receive grants from other organizations like the Watershed Alliance and from our, the Church's Change for the World offering. Four corporate founders made significant in-kind definition uh, definition donations to the garden including rick spencing par lumber dirt huggers and waste connections and eight individual founders made substantial cash donations yeah i also want to recognize kitty hibbs grace tigan and clancy kelly three church members who did the heavy lifting in planting, planning and executing the garden program. Without them, there would be no garden. Um, let's see, let's go to the next slide. Oops, okay. So the garden employs organic, earth-friendly, sustainable practices. It provides fresh, healthy food to gardeners who were referred to us by our community partners. We actually have five partners who give it, who get uh, gardeners for us, and these are the Maplewood Neighborhood Association, the YWCA, NAACP, Vancouver High School, and Martin Luther King Elementary School. In the spring of 2020, the gardeners began to plant their garden beds, and more experienced gardeners worked with new gardeners to teach them how to grow food. We had garden monitors who checked on the garden every day during the growing season and pro provided a helping hand when needed. We're grateful for the help we received from master gardeners who actually provided some one on one assistance for our gardeners. Other educate we had a lot of educational components other educational efforts included orientation sessions with gardeners on site education a lending library, a newsletter, and workshops on gardening topics. Gardeners learned about 
uh, lasagna gardening. Uh, we, we use that to build our beds and also learned about square foot gardening, which was adopted in most of the gardens. Gardeners grew so many vegetables that we donated surplus to the Share the Bounty program, which is on the right uh, uh, picture on this, on this uh, page. We had a great first year and we're looking forward to the next gardening season right now. We, we, we have some things we want to uh, do in the, follow, in the next year to enhance our program. One is that we had um, Spanish and Russian speaking gardeners. We had a really diverse gardening group and we want to improve our communications with the gardeners who don't speak is English as their first language. We want to expand our educational workshops. We would like to institutionalize the garden operations. The first year was really crazy trying to get everything done at once and we want to slow it down a little bit and make sure we know exactly how we're doing things. And we also need to expand our leadership team. I'd like to thank the Gar Master Gardener Foundation for your generous grant and thanks for giving us the opportunity to share our story. Thank you so much, Pat. That was great. Uh, what a neat project. And I did include in here, I can put it in the chat box probably, there was a um, link if you want to see more about the Maplewood Mosley project. And I'll put that in the uh, chat box a little bit later. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Rob Rosser, and he is going to tell us about the Fort Vancouver Historic Site Interpretive Garden. Rob, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Well, hello, everybody. I'm glad to see we have so many people here. It's a fascinating um, little group of different 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 people uh, with so many great projects. But I'm with the Fort Vancouver Garden. So as many of you know, Fort Vancouver Historic Garden is a one half acre rep interpretive representation of the Hudson Bay Fur Trading Post in the 1840s. The current garden demonstrates plants and gardening methods that have been documented as having been in the garden at that time. Over the years, our Current garden has become a showplace for our, our for community, excuse me. We offer information, education, and ideas to our visitors. All the plantings in the garden is cared for, performed by approximately 18 volunteers. Many are Washington State University master gardeners. Volunteers might work one to seven days a week in the garden during peak seasons, and volunteers begin working in the WS Greenhouse in early February and March, which is unbelievable that it's already here. During the pandemic, the National Park System held us to six volunteers in the garden at one time. So that had an impact on our affecting the garden issue. Uh, vegetables and fruits are harvested regularly. Some are used in the front, uh, the fort kitchen for historic cooking demonstrations. Many are used for preserving, pickling, drying, and salting for future kitchen use. Employing methods used in the 1840s. We're happy to share excess produce by donating our surplus to local food banks. Thousands of visitors do come through the garden every season, which is a wonderful treat for all of us. Most of them have questions about the plants grown in the garden, especially unfamiliar or little known plants such as cardoon and pomegranate. Guests share their own gardening experience or ask for growing methods they can use in their own gardens. <clears throat> Uh, many of the visitors are local residents who walk through the garden regularly, as well as those from around the U.S. and from around the world. Many of them get ideas they can use in their own gardens, and in the last couple of years, guests actually appreciate the fact that the garden has become a place to relax and get away. Many of the challenges of the current pandemic have had a big effect, so a lot of people who visit the garden consider an essential to their mental well-being. Uh, money from the Master Gardener Foundation of Clark County Grant has been used to purchase seeds, fertilizer, and plants such as blueberries, 
strawberries, and dahlia tubers. This generous grant allows us to present a classic demonstration of our historic garden at its best. And we're proud to share the Port Vancouver Garden with our own community, as well as visitors from around the world. So just to say, we appreciate everybody who comes down to visit, and we do appreciate the funding that we've had from the WSU. Thank you. It's fun to see the pictures. I'm so used to not to doing them on a slideshow, but it's great to see them around. Yeah, that's neat. Your pictures were just beautiful. And I think this final one with a was a panoramic here coming up here. Let me see if I can click forward. I love oh. the one with my little kid, uh, Jude, in there. There you go. And then uh, this looks like some great educational opportunities here. And then there's your volunteers. Yeah, there's a few of them. And that's that really, really awesome panoramic shot that somebody took. That's my pick. I love it. Look at that. I mean, that is just yeah. fabulous, isn't it? Yeah, if, you, if, if any of you have never been there, and probably everyone here, all 57 participants have been there. But if you haven't, you've got to go. All right. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And next, we're going to jump to Robin Dobson and Kathleen Perillo with the Clark College Native Plant Garden. Are you guys uh, there? Yeah, we're here. Hello. <laughs> Hi. All right. I'll, okay, just... I'll, I'll start it off uh, just to give you an because uh, we actually applied for the grant. This is I'm work. I'm the treasurer for the Center for Ecodynamic Restoration, uh, CEDAR, we go by. And uh, we do restoration work in the gorge as well as in other areas outside the state. Um, in this particular case, well, most of the time what we do is we, we've developed this partnership with Clark College and we take advantage of students, educate, work with them in restoration activities, uh, help them learn, uh, about land stewardship and, and hands-on restoration activities. Um, and so this was a natural fit. Uh, they were, we've worked with Clark, the Native Plant uh, Center at Clark College to create sort of a, a native garden, a native plant garden. Um, and we've helped with the design and some of the technical uh, problems and, and, and uh, activities, as well as uh, helping them design which plants go in which areas, and uh, it has been it has been a really a very nice uh, collaborative effort uh, for us, and we applied for the uh, for the funding from the uh, uh, from you guys, and the most of that that funding went for signs. We needed some interpretive signs for the for the garden. And with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen Perillo, who's the, uh, the person in charge of the Native Plant Center, and she'll give you the specifics as to what was accomplished. Thanks, Robin. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here and great to hear from so many people that we partner with and work with. So I'm so delighted. Um, what you're seeing in this slide is our students. Um, Robin is in the slide, too. Um, as we were granted uh, some space at Clark College's main campus to create the um, demo garden. So if you could just go to the next slide, you will see um, students working hard, learning about design, thanks to CEDAR, uh, the Center for Ecodynamic Restoration, um, talked about design and how, how to make things uh, beautiful and you know, native and make people want to go into this garden. So this all happened just prior to the pandemic. <laughs> um, so you can imagine, you know, we had great high hopes. We had funding from the Oregon um, Hardy Plant Society, as well as the Master Gardener Foundation, and we were ready to go. And then, of course, COVID, as many of you have mentioned in your presentations. Um, but we, we, did a little bit. We weren't really able to get on campus for about a year. So if you can go to the next picture, I think maybe you'll see um, 
so we did do some planting and um, last winter and um, it looks, you know, this is pictures I recently took, so it's not in all in bloom and all beautiful, but on the side closest to the building, that's kind of the shade side. And we planted a variety of native plants from snowberry to twinberry to uh, lupins, um, violas, lots of beautiful native plants that did quite well over last summer, but on the east side, which is the side um, yeah, the side that the pointer's on, that was our sun, full sun. And of course, you know, we had lots of lovely plants that love full sun, but not 115 degrees. Um, we had trouble getting access to the campus still to do irrigation and, um, you know, uh, TLC. So that side is going to be replanted. Although you see the California poppies loved it, the goldenrods uh, still loved it, and red flower and currant. So we'll keep Keep the natives that survived and we'll weed it and we're going to replant it with some sun loving plants and hopefully we're back on campus now so we can give it the TLC that it needs throughout the summer no matter what curveball we get. Um, and so you can see that building behind there that's our native plant center and we want people to be able to come and see what native plants look like in bloom. We have uh, native plant sales and it's wonderful, but people often say, well, yeah, what's this going to look like in my yard? So this demo garden is fabulous. And if you go to the next slide, what's really fabulous <laughs> is what you funded, which is our sign, our welcome sign, which is also being, um, it's a, a metal sign that Soha uh, in Vancouver, Soha Sign Company is, currently they have it, so they're making it right now, but this is what it's going to look like. Um, the graphics were done by our own digital media group on campus, so we're lucky to have folks um, that we can connect with to do this. And um, people will be able to look for these native plants um, throughout the garden as they walk throughout the garden. So um, it's going to be pretty exciting. We're delighted and to have this funding um, that allowed us this beautiful sign, and it's going to have be installed in March. And then my time is up, I can see. So um, it's going to be installed this March, and we're going to have during our um, early spring sale. So we'll have a little unveiling, <laughs> I guess. I think that might be our last slide. Was yes. there one more? Okay, yeah. yeah. So anyway, this is this is we're just so delighted to be able to to uh, share this with the community, um, and we're excited to get it in finally. So thank That's you so great. much for having us and funding us. Thank you, Kathleen. I have a quick question. Um, I think someone may have answered it in our chat box, but uh, Karen Wilson wanted to know where on the Clark College campus is this garden located? And then- Oh, Kate great. Said, yeah. Near the science building, is that right? Or do you have a better- It is. There's the greenhouse right off of Reserve Street. And then there's the science, we call it the science complex buildings. They're the older buildings and it's right there. So it's right behind the greenhouse in the science complex. And yes, please, please come. <laughs> It'll be great. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you so much. And next up, I do want to verify, I think um, Marilyn Puccinelli is here to tell us about the center. That's what it's commonly known as. And this is the Clark County Adventist Community Center Garden. Are you there, Marilyn? Yes, I am. Can you hear That's me? That's great. Yes, we can. Thank you so much. I know a few of us had a little trouble getting in tonight, but we are here. Thank you for doing this. Um, I'll go ahead and, and forward the slide. You can start speaking. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Janice, um, I, I think that you can just rotate these uh, as I'm speaking because they're not in any particular order. So, well, I'll do that. Okay. I'll just go back and forth. Sure. That's great. Um, have you ever longed for tomatoes that tasted like the ones your grandmother grew? We all know that you can't buy that taste anymore. And besides, our soil is depleted, our food is deplo depleted of nutrients, and so our bodies are depleted. We are missing so much more than just the taste. I got interested in gardening through my brother, Lynn Hoag. 
he is passionate about helping others grow the very best healthy healing foods, even better than the best organic. As, a, as kids, we had our own garden rows to take care of, and we proudly did so. And Lynn has made a lifelong study of gardening principles and experimenting with it. So I kind of got interested and I have followed his leading and try to do the same thing at the center. Uh, it starts in the soil. Uh, so we, we test our soil and from the recommendations of the soil test, we, we add the minerals and that allows us to have 100% uh, of what our body needs. When we eat that tomato, we are getting 100% of what our body needs. So let me tell you a little bit about the center, the garden at the center. It's on Fourth Plain. It used to be the old Red Cross building. And um, we have um, two, about 2,000 square foot garden rows. And um, we have tested our soil there. We are in our fifth year. This will be our fifth year. And our soil test came back. Um, Lynn said it's one of the best soils he's ever seen. So um, last year, uh, 2021, the garden produced um, tomatoes, 1,400 pounds of tomatoes. And our other veggies were about 2,000 pounds. So the total produce out of that 2,000 square feet was 3,500 pounds of produce. You say, how, what do we do with it? Um, we um, use it to give to the people who come for food there, food and clothing. And the volunteers are also welcome to take what they would like. Um, we had six rows of tomatoes, approximately 60 plants. And along the fence, the street side, we had uh, about 60 cherry tomato plants as well. And people can come by the sidewalk and um, we just have you pick. And they really enjoy that. Moms and stro with the strollers, they'll come by and have their buckets and fill up their, their produce with the cherries. Um, thanks to Eleanor Hedke, the director, CCACS, we applied for a master gardening grant. And thanks to the uh, master gardeners, we got a high tunnel. And this was our first year to grow in the high tunnel. It was a 50 by 25 foot. And it, um, basically what a high tunnel does is, is extends the growing season. You can get your plants out earlier and you can um, harvest later. So um, we were even harvesting in December. We give credit also to the late Fernando Flores. You see his picture in there smiling and there he is. Um, he died of COVID. Uh, he, he was the mastermind behind building the high tunnel. And uh, along with Alan Faber, uh, Farber and Tom Fritz and, uh, and others. Um, it wasn't finished early enough to, to take advantage of the early planting, but we did take advantage of the later. Now, Alan took over uh, the rest and um, with his scientific and analytical mind, uh, he has quantified how the high tunnel would affect production and so forth. So if any of you are interested in um, some of this, um, put your name in, uh, or your um, email address in the um, chat box and, and we'll get you the information that he's so well put, put together. Um, we weighed each individual uh, plant, plant and counted all the, uh, like you see boxcar willy there. Uh, we weighed all the boxcar willy for the year. And then you see um, the production. 
So that one on the lowest there produced the least, that's the Aunt Rubies. So we're not gonna plant Aunt Rubies this next year. We will plant Acker, Acker, West Virginia, looks like was the biggest producer. Anyway, that's kind of an interesting sideline. Um, so in closing, um, I think I'm ready to close. Um, healthy bodies come from eating healthy food, which comes from healthy soil. So start with a soil test that tells you what your plants need to grow, 100% of the nutrition your body needs. We're always happy to um, have volunteers. So I would um, invite any, any of you who would like to volunteer and the perks are that you get to have some of the produce. And thank you, Master Gardeners, um, for helping us out with this project. I think I have done my five minutes. Yes, thank you so much, Marilyn. What an interesting project. That's great to be able to get fresh tomatoes so late in the season there. Really cool. Thank you. Okay, and then next up, we have, it looks like our final presenter, Wanda Wilson and her daughter Karen are going to tell us a little bit about the Mini Stromgen Memorial Garden. Here we go. Um, Karen or Wanda or both, are you there? Yes. So I'm Karen Wilson. I am here. And um, yeah, so we are ever so grateful to the Clark County Master Gardener Foundation. Um, for assistance with our project. We have been um, growing this community garden. We're actually, we're not quite certain how long. It's been at least 10 years, but um, from the start, the Master Gardener Foundation has been there um, to support us. We have, so Wanda is a Master Gardener. And um, on the other end of the garden, the far end um, in this image, there are some small raised beds. And that is where the children from the daycare center, um, there's a daycare center that is um, housed in the church. Um, so the children in the daycare center garden the small raised beds. And um, for the last couple of years, at least, um, another master gardener has worked closely with the children. Um, so they, um, she teaches lessons and they go out and they work in the garden together and the children um, weed and they harvest and they take home their produce. And um, it's been fantastic. Um, so we are ever so grateful to the Master Gardener Foundation for the support. Um, it's helped pay the water bills. Um, which as you know, um, <laughs> we can't have a garden without the water. And the location is um, at the uh, Vancouver Heights United Methodist Church um, up there off of MacArthur Boulevard near McLaughlin Middle School. Um, love to have you swing by, it's a mess right now, but um, hopefully with spring coming, we'll be back out there. And if any of you master gardeners on this call know anything or have any information about dry farming tomatoes, um, that is something that some of the gardeners have been very interested in and wanted to try last year, but unfortunately that June heat dome killed that idea. So um, we may go for it again. I've only found research out of um, Oregon State University. So if any of you folks have anything, send it our way, we'd be grateful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. That concludes our grant site tour. I, uh, I see nothing but really nice comments, you guys, in the chat box and appreciate you, um, everyone who has come and stayed on for the whole presentation. I hope you've learned some things. If you have any questions about the um, presenters or you want to get in contact with any of them, I'm going to give you guys my email address. It's Gardener Janice, and that's J-A-N-I-S at gmail.com. And you can go ahead and send 
Um, me, if you have a questions or you want to ask one of these presenters a question, go ahead and send me an email. I will pass that on to them. And as far as foundation business, once again, thanks for coming. And you will uh, be receiving something in your email again regarding the next presentation. We might be skipping March, but we're certainly going to have a great presentation set up for you in April and for basically the rest of the year. So happy um, gardening. And we will see you in April, if not March. And for sure, we're going to see you at the plant sale, which once again begins May 6th. So Mother's Day is May 8th. And May 6th is the Master Gardener Foundation members only by appointment day. So you can get a head start on all your plant purchases. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll